Well, welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hey, everybody! Welcome into episode forty-four. I've got a very—I say this every week, but seriously, this one I've got a very special episode and an extra special guest in this one because we're going to talk about the story of Divi. For those of you who have followed me for a while, you know that Divi is the WordPress theme that I've used exclusively for since 2014. It's the theme that we use. It's been a rock for myself and my web design agency. And we're going to talk about the story of this game-changing WordPress theme and how it was created and how it's evolved uh, with none other than one of its creators, Kenny Singh. Kenny is one of the creators of Divi. And this interview, guys, man, I'm so excited for you because we had a blast of a talk and Kenny was just very open about the experience of uh, helping with creating Divi. And as you'll find out through this interview, uh, Kenny has had one heck of a career to this point working with Elegant Themes as their lead designer initially and then now as the design director at Elegant Themes, but he's also worked for Google and uh, some other companies you may have heard of that you'll hear about. And it was fascinating getting to hear about the story of Divi, how they created it, how it's evolved, and how they continue to level it up and continue to be just the old, the dominant theme in the WordPress market. I mean, if you're not aware, Divi has, gosh, I think at this point, well over 700,000 official customers with millions of sites online using Divi. Uh, And it's, again, it's been a rock for my business. And to get to talk to Kenny, to hear about what goes on behind the scenes with creating, managing, and updating a theme was fascinating. I think for those of you who use Divi, and even those of you who don't use Divi or maybe use other themes as well, I think either way, you'll get a lot of value from this and just get a a kick out of, honestly, what, what they have to go through with a theme because you can't please everybody. And, and they, uh, let's just say I learned that you really have to grow some thick skin when you're a theme creator, but I just love elegant themes and Divi and the guys behind it. The, the, the team behind elegant themes is remarkable. And I loved getting a chance to get a peek behind the curtain. And I think you will too. Now for this episode, this one's going to be presented by, you can probably guess it since we're going to be talking about Divi my Divi WordPress beginners course. I do have a course where I will show you the absolute most important things you need to know about Divi to fast track building websites with WordPress and Divi because as you'll find out through this interview and through playing around with Divi, it's a very robust system. It's as simple or as complex as you wanna make it, but there is a lot that you can learn and dive into. Quite frankly, it can be a little overwhelming when you're starting out. So that's the reason I created my Divi Beginners course. It'll show you the most important things you need to know, and it'll help you, again, fast track your journey to building awesome websites with WordPress and Divi. So if interested, I would love to help you out in that course. Uh, Check out the show notes for this episode, which will have a link to the course. And if I have any live active promos, that will be on there for you as well. All right, guys, without further ado, enjoy my super in-depth and great conversation with Kenny Singh about the story of Divi. And we also get into a lot of really cool stuff, including his experience uh, with these different companies. We talked about imposter syndrome, all kinds of good stuff you're gonna pull from. Enjoy the chat with Kenny Singh. Kenny, welcome to the show, man. Awesome to have you on. Thanks for having me, Josh. Glad to be here. So we're gonna have some fun in this one because uh, I think I actually have to thank you for like everything in my life right now because <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, creating Divi, which you had a big part in, a big role in. We actually, you and I met at WordCamp US. Three was years it 17? Ago. Yeah, I think it was 17. Yeah. And we had a great chat. And I remember thinking after talking with you, I think we talked for like a half an hour and I was like, why didn't I record that? It was <laughs> such a good chat. So that's what we're doing now. We're going to record it. We're going to talk about it because... You helped create Divi, which has literally changed my life. I have not used another theme. I don't know if you know this. I, I have don't not know used that. another theme since 2014, man, since I, since I got onto it. It's um, amazing. So the community has been incredible. Now, as you know, I'm doing this podcast and my endeavor with joshhall.co and Divi is a big part of that. Um, so yeah, man, really excited to talk with you. Before we get right into it, uh, maybe you want to just tell everybody who you are, 
where you are and what your role is with Elegant Themes. Yeah, so I'm the design director at Elegant Themes. I live in San Francisco, California. Um, the company is fully distributed now as of about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, so I don't have to be in San Francisco, but um, all, the, all the people that I work with the most closely are here in San Francisco. Um, people that know the people behind Elegant Themes, that's uh, Nick Roach and Mitch Skolnick here in San Francisco as well. Um, my role with Elegant Themes has changed a little bit over the years, but has pretty much stayed steady. I, I was um, joined, I joined Elegant Themes in 2013 um, as a designer. It was, I was the, the only designer, so I guess I could call myself the lead designer. Lead um, designer sounds cool. <laughs> Uh, but it's always been interesting because Nick is a designer, which is rare for a, a software C CEO. Um, mm, yeah. So, yeah, lead designer from 2013 to 2015. I left the company in 2015 um, and rejoined back in 2017. And I have been there ever since as the design director. Awesome. Yeah, let's talk about that. If you, I think it'd be a great place to start to just get a little bit of backstory about what you did because you worked for a couple companies that I think a couple people have heard of. Um, <laughs> one was Google and was it, was it Apple too? Is that right? Yeah, Apple was in a little bit of a different um, capacity, but I can talk about yeah, that stuff. If yeah, you, well, yeah, what did that look like? Because I think that'll be some great backstory uh, okay. as far as uh, what you've done in your roles. Cool. I'll, I guess we'll start from the beginning um, without giving you too much of, an, uh, of a bio. But, Go back um, as far as you need to, man. Let's start with baby, baby Kenny. Take baby us all Kenny. the way back. <laughs> cool. I started um, getting into kind of the creative field when I was really young, as most kids do, just like with building and drawing. And that kind of stuck with me through my teen years, which is usually when that stuff drops off for a lot of people. Um, and I am part of a family that's a lot of contractors and engineers and just really kind of like technically minded people with a few little creative people here and there. And I, and I was exposed to a lot of, to both, you know, sides of my brain when I was a kid. And I wanted to become an architect for my entire childhood. I want to be an architect or like something in the field of math and sciences. And um, as I kind of got towards college or in applying for colleges, um, I was really excited to be in a structural engineering field. And at the time, I wasn't doing anything creative, really. I was, you know, I was doing some hobbies on the side. But I got into um, a, a really good relationship with my art teacher at the time. Um, and, I, and he was just like, constantly encouraging me to explore art and design. And he got me this job at a screen printing shop. And um, I was sweeping the floors that eventually um, turned into being actually the, the lead graphic designer at that screen printing shop within a year which was not something I'd ever plan on doing. You know, I learned the, you know, Illustrator and Photoshop, all, all, the, all the basics. And once I started um, my program at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo as a civil engineer, um, I was just like super bummed on it. You know, it was, I, I was getting all the math and science, but it was just the creativity just wasn't there. And I was doing so much graphic design and freelance on the side just as a teenager. And I realized, you know, it's like, wow, this is actually like something I can do to make a living. This is actually a career. Um, and so I ended up switching my major. I stayed at Cal Poly. I switched my major into graphic design, um, which is a very print heavy, advertise heavy program. You know, we were designing magazines and books and, and posters, things like that, logos. And I was in that program with Nick. That's actually where I met Nick Roach. Oh, um, I always wondered that. Yeah, I wondered how you guys met. Yeah, so we both transferred into the program the same year. So I had been doing um, two years of engineering degree. Nick, um, I think was at, I think he was doing like local community college for a couple years and building the what has become now Elegant Themes. Uh, and so when we met in school, um, we kind of like, we were buddies because we were both like two of four transfers for that year. So we were taking all the same courses, catching up, not part of the art clicks. We kind of just had like a few people that we could really relate to. It was really funny. I mean, I'll do a little tangent, but I remember Nick, you know, saying, introducing himself to the class and saying like, Hey, if anybody wants a website, like go to my website and buy a theme. And I remember oh like, my who's gosh, this guy? That's, that's hilarious. This guy? You know, he was like getting like two hours of sleep a night and, um, so, and, and you could tell, but he, you know, he was really inspiring, um, throughout those years. And then, so when I graduated, um, Nick and I had always talked about working together 
Um, we really respected each other's design sense and skills, and but we both went our separate ways. He, he kind of dropped out right before he graduated because Elegant Themes was taken off. It only made sense. Um, and What a badass story, too, to drop out because your business is booming. <laughs> oh, I know, especially like... <laughs> six weeks before graduation. Nick's so <laughs> humble and so like soft spoke. If anyone meets him at like a Divi meetup one day, you would never know he, uh, no. you know, he's the man behind Elegant Themes because he's so chill and so cool. Yeah, no, it's definitely the coolest part about him. You just never know. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I ended up graduating and I got a job locally um, in San Luis Obispo at a pretty large uh, digital agency, just full service traditional digital agency. Um, they did. They had big clients, you know, Apple, Samsung, um, Facebook. I mean, just big, big clients somehow. Uh, and I ended up getting this role on the like the Apple team, and they, it was actually they were actually like an official contractor of Apple. So they had a room that was like locked off, security that had to be like approved by Apple. Um, it was really, it was really kind of like. Um, it was cool as a new grad, you know, doing this, like saying no like Apple was my dream job at the time and I wasn't technically employed by Apple, but I was, um, you know, Apple was paying the bills and pretty quickly, um, Apple, our client at Apple was looking for some full-time on-site contractors. And so they were targeting young kids without families, uh, that had nothing to lose, you know, no ties and to just kind of uproot their life. And so I moved to Cupertino for about a year, I think. Uh, just lived in some random apartment and uh, worked on site at Apple for a year working on their iBooks platform. So I helped launch their um, their program for converting like traditional textbooks into mm -hmm. iPad experiences. What year, what year was that that you worked for them? 2011. Okay. So a couple of years before. Yeah. And so this. before that, I was, I had really had no web experience. I had no digital experience. I was doing, I mean, I had experience using software, but not designing it. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so that was my first exposure to designing for screens. It, it was very technical at Apple. They're, it's insane. I mean, you can tell their design quality is good, but like once you're in it, you can tell why just like, how many rounds of revisions and just like the talent that's there. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it can be very production heavy there because someone at the top is establishing those design guidelines, you know, and there's so many tens of thousands of people that work there. And, and so I just really felt like a very small person in, in a big pond mm -hmm. and I did well there. Um, it ended up leading to a job offer from them that wasn't super appealing, but like literally in that, in that moment, I just said no. And it was, I just knew, you know, that it, it wasn't going to turn into my dream job. I, I think that what people think goes on at these big companies at Apple, at Google, um, isn't all rainbows and butters, butterflies, you know? I mean, probably a lot of people listening to this podcast work either for themselves or for a small, small um, independent company. It's very, very different. Um, and I, I was coming from, uh, you know, just being a kid in college to going and working with these people that had been in the industry for, for decades. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we can get in a little bit into imposter syndrome later, but, you know, I just felt really not very confident in myself um, during that time. And so I was still in you conversations. Oh, go ahead. It, so just as an aside, I, that is a really important point where things look like rainbows and butterflies on the outside. And then, yeah, you get into what's really going on and it's like, wow, it's how do they get stuff done? Or like, this is not what I thought. I know when I subcontracted for a local design firm here in Columbus, on the outside, it looked like their websites are beautiful, that the process had to be amazing. And when I sub subcontracted for them, come to find out it was a disaster. Like it was a mess with how yeah. they ran stuff and, and their processes. So it was eye opening and kind of helped me with imposter syndrome, which like you said, I think we'll talk about here in a little bit. But yeah, totally. That's that's an interesting take on all that. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's like we have a hard time managing and running a business of five people. Like Apple's 70,000, 100,000. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it just, it, it literally becomes impossible to do it well. And so um, I was in conversations with Nick um, at the time and I still hadn't really met Mitch, um, but 
Nick was doing some really cool things. Every time I would go and visit him in San Francisco, he was showing me some cool new demo that um, I can't remember some of the themes he was showing me, but he was working on a theme called Convertible. Um, he was also working oh, on... Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that He was that also one. working on um, some themes with some like cool Ajax stuff. He was always you know, trying to use the, the latest in HTML and... and and use it in his themes and and it was it was always just like so cool to see what he was doing and so what did i what i ended up doing was i i just said can i come work for you like is this do you need a designer and so we rented an office in san francisco and and before nick and mitch were just working out of out of nick's apartment in san francisco and we decided let's let's expand a little bit let's get an office and so nick and mitch did all the legwork and stuff while i was still ending my contract and so when i joined Mm -hmm. I kind of got to to join them in an office. And so that was like culture shock for me um, because I had to design websites. I, you know, I had, I've never really had experience designing for the web. I had experience designing for screens, but yeah, it's a completely different ball game, isn't it? <laughs> not to mention creating tools to design a website, right? It wasn't necessarily yeah. designing websites here, but back in the day, when I say back in the day, 2013, we were still elegant themes was still designing um per theme releases right it was like it wasn't like a divvy situation right it was like let's launch a theme every month or every did you did you like transitioning to that working with them or did you kind of feel like (laughs) did you feel like you took a step down because you're working at apple and then now you're working you know with Um, with i'm sure i'm sure it was an amateur hour with nick and mitch but what was it like that kind of transition there were two sides to that, right? Like in one way I had way more responsibility um, because it was just me. Whereas before there were so many checks and balances that, you know, um, you like a lot of designers want freedom. They're like, I don't want a manager. I don't want people telling me what to do. I don't want a bunch of design by committee. And then once you get out of that, you're like, holy crap. Like I have, yeah. I, you know, you're like looking to your left, looking to your right and no one's there. Well, and the problem um, is with on the opposite side of freedom is responsibility. So a lot yeah. of designers, when they get that freedom, it's like, well, crap, there's also a ton of responsibility that I need to keep up with as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was just like trying to make myself worthy of, you know, helping this company go from like literally like three people to four people, which is like a big step, you know? And so I felt a lot of responsibility, but it was fun. Um, and it was, I mean, I knew nothing about WordPress, dude. I had never even like... <laughs> logged in you know and so it was it was scary you know i mean we can get more into this i guess i'll finish my origin story really quick um and then we can kind of track back but sure um after two years um you know i was seeing all of my friends kind of get into these big companies in san francisco and and the tech industry was booming for designers before it was very inch heavy um development heavy and you know, I was working with just a few people and I got like very claustrophobic at Elegant Themes. It was just so few of us. Um, and it was like, I don't know. I, I I was having, I think this word is fairly new, but FOMO, you know, I was like, miss, I felt like I was really missing out um, mm-hmm. on what my career could be, right? And so out of nowhere, um, Google contacted me. They just kind of like headhunted. Um, And literally four weeks later, I was, you know, on site at Google and, um, that honestly, it was a terrible experience. I, I learned so much. I learned so much at Google, so much at Apple, like my advice for people going into big companies from small companies, even if you don't like it, listen, learn, watch, observe, figure out, because there's some things that these big companies have figured out, right? They're making billions of dollars. They're doing something right figure out what that is, learn from it, take it away um, and apply it potentially into a smaller business later or into a smaller company that you go to later. And so the entire time I was there, I was thinking like what I'm doing in a year long span, I was doing in about four days at Elegant Themes before. Oh, wow. Um, You know, I was doing pretty much all the front end dev at Elegant Themes before I was doing the design. I was doing the project management. I was doing everything. When you go into a big company, there's, 37 people on your team doing that same thing and it takes them a whole year and it was just struggle after struggle and i remember i was working on the 
payments platform. So this is the underlying platform that allows people to pay money to Google. Um, and so I was creating basically a flow and a platform, you know, that would foster whatever the money that they make, $150 billion a year. And it was like changing one pixel, someone would freak out and be like, well, what if we lose money? Right. And so oh. turning that ship was tough. And so I remember I was like, how can I have some impact here in the same way that I had impact at Elegant Themes with Divi? Um, and I said, let's make our internal payments platform, a cloud-based software that is um, configurable by anyone. So for example, you probably use something like Stripe or PayPal, and that experience is cool, but you kind of just get like a code snippet and it just like, you click on something and then like the Stripe UI pops up, right? Um, you know, and my idea was like, well, what if we had that same experience, but you can completely customize and design that experience mm. and so basically like divi for stripe right if you can imagine that and so like a stripe form and a stripe interface for checking out and um it scared a lot of people basically got literally people walking out of meetings of me proposing these ideas and it really was discouraging i mean i had engineers i, I was there for like half a year when i started proposing this stuff um and i had engineers walk out of the room on me just like who are you like, you don't realize how long we've been working on this. Why are you trying to change how this works and what our business model is? And so about a year later, I got this new manager and he's like, we should take this to the cloud. We should create <laughs> a cloud-based software, a SaaS software that allows people to configure um, their checkout flow with drag and drop. And I was like, dude, preach into the choir. You know, <laughs> he's like, I just yeah. used this. I just used this WordPress theme to build a website called Divi. And I was like, in that moment, I was just like, what am I doing here? Wow. You know? And it was he like, had no idea it was mine. <laughs> he had no idea. And so basically from that kind of like kicked off the series of events of me being like, you know, what I was doing before and what I was learning and what I was like, the impact that I had is, is now influencing this level eight person, you know, at Google super smart guy um, to want to do something that I was doing two years ago. What you know? an interesting thought that you just said it, the fact that, you know, this number eight guy or whatever at Google is drawing inspiration and has a lot of interest <laughs> in a multi-billion dollar platform from somebody who was working with a couple other guys in this little software company called Elegant Themes back in the day. That's a, yeah. what a valuable point in a, a good, a good lesson in just impact. Like you don't have to be the top dog of this massive company to make a big impact. Yeah. And, you know, speak up for what you believe in too. You know, even if people are going to tell you no, it, it might just mean that you're in the wrong, wrong boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, so I, mean, I ended up... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kenny. Yeah, just, just in the story, um, I ended up just seeking out other job opportunities, um, one of which was going back to elegant themes and it was the hardest decision I ever made. You know, it was like how many people go back to a company that they've quit. There was a lot of like, are they going to want me back? Is there going to be this bad taste in their mouths of, of me leaving? Cause it was, it was a bummer that I left, you know, it's hard leaving a company with friends. Um, but, and, and also I was like, am I going to have that fear of missing out again? You know, do I go and work for another big company and, and so I got some job offers from other big uh, companies in the area, um, in the Valley. And it was like, man, am I, should I go work at, you know, at, should I stay in tech and, you know, you know, use all the same buzzwords and, um, just kind of ultimately came down to like, what is going to really make me happy? And at, at that point I was just watching Divi grow and I just felt like that's actually what I'm missing out on. And so, uh, yeah, I ended up back at Elegant Themes, um, kind of asked to take on a larger role. So I'm running a, a design team here at Elegant Themes that focuses mainly on designing uh, like the layout packs. Um, and then I focus on running that team and then also actually working on Divi as a, as a tool as well. How big is the team that works on the layout packs? Um, right now we're, we're four people um, and a photographer. Gotcha. 
I was always curious. I never knew the the scope of that. Yeah, that's great though, man. I mean, I, I wanted to really talk about your story and the origin of all this because it's important with how it translates to Divi. And I love that example that you talked about with the guy who was, hey, there's this tool called Divi I use. You should check this out. And you're like, bro, I made <laughs> Divi, man. <laughs> did I you tell him that? It. Did you tell him? Does he know that you were a creator of Divi? Or? I did tell him. Yeah, I did tell okay. him. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty man, cool. What a what full a wild circle. moment! Yeah, what a full <laughs> circle moment. So let's talk about that, man. Let's go back to like the the origin of Divi. So you're working for Elegant Themes 2013 or so. Yep. Um, yeah, just if you would, man, I, I would love just as somebody who Divi has just completely changed my life. I know a lot of people listening would love to know how the heck did that come about? Like the name? Yeah. Why don't you just take us back to the beginning of Divi? All right. Yeah. It, I mean. Whew. it's hard looking back on Divi sometimes, you know, it's like all <laughs> there's, there's so many things that I wish I was like a web designer for when I designed them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what I was bringing to the table to elegant themes was just a creative mind, um, not necessarily like a super technical mind. And so when I joined, my first role was to just create a WordPress theme for dot org. So it would be the first free theme that Elegant Themes put out. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of a perfect opportunity because what I was going to create wasn't going to be mind boggling. It wasn't, you know, I just needed to learn what a post type was and what post format was and, you know, what a loop was. Like the, all of these terms where I was like literally designing this theme without knowing what those things are. I didn't know taxonomies. I, I, mean, I literally didn't know anything about WordPress. And so Nick probably was like, what, what am I doing? You know, I was like mm-hmm. asking him a thousand questions a minute and... Um, so I don't know for, for the super fans, this theme was called Serene. Um, I think it is now off the repository, um, for legacy reasons, but you know, that was when I was like, this is crazy that I'm designing a theme that someone's going to use and everybody that uses it, it's going to look like this, you know? Oh, gotcha. So Uh, it's like kind of a hit you in the face moment. Like everyone might not want this same look, right? As far as that theme. Yeah, I mean, it was just like, I mean, it was cool because it was like, well, I'll just do one of these every two weeks, <laughs> you know? And at the time, uh, Avada was taking off. Um, Visual Composer was kind of taking off. And there were some other players in the game. And it was like th- this whole, like, I don't even know what people were calling them. Pay- I, they weren't called page builders. I think, you know, it's all in one themes is what it was called. Yeah. Cause that's how I started, which most WordPress web designers, you'd go to theme forest or something, you buy a theme or in the case of elegant themes, the reason I liked it initially was like, Ooh, instead of buying a new theme every time I can just have an elegant themes license. And then I have like 20, 30, 40 different site templates I can use. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, Nick, um, he was like, you know, I think we need to, I think we may need to may, maybe do something bigger. Um, it's going to maybe take us a few months to develop. It's really funny. We're talking like in the scope of a few months, right? Um, and again, like I was just learning WordPress. And so my ideas weren't huge, but they were big. And so basically I had this goal. It's like, how do I create something that could literally replace every single theme that Elegant Themes has? Mm. How could we achieve that, you know? Um, and so that was kind of the goal. And um Nick had done a lot of groundwork on the Elegant Themes customizer, which is like a tough thing to look back on sometimes. Um, <laughs> the, you know, oh, I remember that. panel yeah. Yes, um, yeah. and convertible, which was a huge inspiration for, for Divi 1.0. And so I was taking a ton of inspiration from Avada and, and some of these other big ones. And because it was like, all I had to look to for inspiration, you know? Um, and, and I was basically taking like, I think I took like a screenshot of like a random, like 200, 500 websites or something like that. And I said, how do we create an underlying, you know, framework that would allow us to build all these websites. And so that was kind of the, the start of that. And it eventually um, turned into like, let's create styles for these themes or for these things, for all these elements, you know, all the different modules. And the problem was I wasn't breaking enough out of that idea of like an elegant themes theme. And so that's why a lot of the Divi modules have some styling to them, Mm -hmm. you know, 
And part of me, a lot of me really regrets that, you know, of just like, it should have just been com even more bare bones than it is. Um, because I was still trying to implement this like look and feel into something that should have been boilerplate, even more boilerplate than it is. And Divi was revolutionary in that it was pretty boilerplate, you know, when it came out, it was like, when you added something to the page, it was not styled. Um, and, and still to this day, it's like that. And so that was like hard for me to, to break out of that. Like, how do I not really make this visually styled every element um, when you add it to the page? And so, um, well, I can only imagine too, from, from your perspective as a developer and designer at, at Elegant Themes, where you're building pre-built templates basically with these different themes. And I know for me as a designer, it did take me a couple months to be cool with Divi because I had the same effect. I would start these layouts and these modules and they would be very bare bones. And it was almost overwhelming at first to me to have like a blank slate. Now I wouldn't have it any other way. But at yeah. the time I was used to just having these pre-built themes and templates that, yeah, it did take me a little bit to get used to it. But then man, once it did, once I got used to it, it stuck and I've never looked back. Yeah, I think we, we did a lot of things backwards. There's still a lot of things that we should have done in 1.0 that we still haven't done in 4.0. Um, a lot of that's due to legacy. A lot of that's due to, you know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of customers that have websites that we, that we just can't affect, you know, drastically. And so, um, but I think we got fortunate. Like we got lucky. We did things backwards and got lucky um, in that it was people wanted to just be able to build completely from scratch. Um, and that wasn't really a thing yet. You know, like when you added, even these other page builders, when you added an element, it looked very styled, you know, and you could change some colors or some themes. Yeah. Um, and there were times like, I still have a couple sites that I designed in 2012, 2013, before I used Divi to where it would be the same theme. I could do different things. I could change the color styles. I could get into the CSS a little bit, but you could still tell they were the same theme. One reason I love yeah. Divi is you can really customize it completely to where I've had people look at our portfolio and they're like, what theme did you use for this site? And I'm like, Divi. And they're like, <laughs> oh, what about this site? This is obviously different, right? I'm like, that's Divi too. Like you, could, you can literally, I mean, yeah, it, they can look the same if you just customize certain areas or you can completely customize it and make it look yeah. completely different. Yeah, the problem is we didn't build in a ton of global options. You know, it was like we were so focused on the individual elements that um, we never really backed up in scope and looked back, you know, like, let's, let's oh, back okay. up now that we've, we've designed all these micro interactions um, and think of it more globally. And that's honestly is my biggest regret. Um, and we're getting there with a lot of global stuff. We have some cool stuff in the pipeline. Um, but, you know, it, it's once we get there, it's going to be crazy. And it's going to be like, my goal is to replace the need for a child theme for any styling, mm. you know, like use a child theme for what a child theme should be used for, which in my opinion is functionality and extension, not for styling. Um, and I think we're going to get there, which is going to be super, super exciting. And, um, you know, once we, once we started designing for it, we kind of had to have a name, we had to have a logo. Um, and so I was, I was thinking of names and, and I came up with, I remember presenting this mock to Nick and at the top, I put a logo on it and a name and it, it was called Divi, D-I-V-V-Y. Um, and it was just a play on words of divvying something up, dividing the page up, also just the, d the div tag. Um, and I remember Nick overnight, I think ended up sending me a new logo, which is the circle with the D in it, just kind of like that OG logo um and he had changed the spelling to d-i-v-i and it was i was like this is dope this is i was like it's a fake <laughs> word it's like the play on words is there it sounds cool it's concise it's short it looks good and like um we both just kind of like you know usually like a logo and a name goes through like months and months of of revision stuff and nick and i kind of just like we were all, we we're always on the same page and it was just like in 48 hours, we had a name and a logo. Oh, that's awesome. And you yeah. probably felt, I mean, there's nothing better when the stars aligned and you have something where everyone's like, oh, dude, this yeah. is this is it. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. And, and what's funny is that once we 
once we started building Divi, um, we realized how big it could be. Um, and it took a lot longer than we thought. I think we sneak peeked Divi, you know, just like he would normally sneak peek stuff. And we're like, oh, yeah, we'll launch it in a month. We'll launch it in two months. And I think it took us six months to build 1.0. Mm. which is still crazy fast, you know, considering there was not a lot of precedence. And, um, and so we got that out and was like, all right, let's move on to the next theme. You know, and Divi was like done. And so we ended up, <laughs> we ended up designing and building uh, what some people know as extra. Um, and I went just, we went forward in a lot of ways. And we went backwards in a lot of ways. Um, we went backwards and that it was very styled. Yeah, I almost viewed extra as a child theme. It, it reminds me of that type of, like you said, functionality, design, and everything. Yeah. And, and what was funny about extra was like, well, let's just build a new builder into it. New modules, new grid, underlying grid. You know, it was very... WordPress, it was very like category based, tag based, taxonomy based. And it was, um, I think that was me like learning WordPress a little bit more. I was like, oh, I kind of know what's available. Let me create this huge system. Let's make it look awesome, styled. And it was just a step in the wrong direction um, strategically for the company. And so halfway through the development of Extra, Divi was taking off. I mean, it just completely exploded out of nowhere. And we were like, Oh my gosh, we we need to have the Divi Builder inside of Extra. Nice, <laughs> yeah, because it happened quick, didn't it? I mean, it, I don't want to say it was overnight, but I mean, it was just a couple months, right, before it really just exploded. It was fast. It was so new. It was so different. Um, people were intrigued by it, and yeah, I think people were just like excited that they weren't like captive of like sprites and PNGs yeah. and PSDs. There was also. Was Visual Composer out then? I think it was. The only it, time it had I had ever been. tried like a page builder type of thing, I just remember thinking it was just a nightmare experience. And yeah. one of the best parts about Divi, although it did take me again a couple months to get used to it and my mentality to change, the thing I loved was the usability and how like easy it was to navigate the modules and then just the idea of being able to do like different full width sections on a WordPress site was mind blowing for me because none of the other right. themes could do that. Right. Yeah. I think I was like bringing in this very systematic thinking that I had in um, design systems and, and engineering and just like thinking about it, things very structurally. And there are things structurally in Divi that definitely need a revamp, but you know, the, the idea of like having a section was pretty revolutionary in the page building space. You know, it was just like most things were just like a series of rows um, and blocks and, and, you know, for people listening that, that weren't original users of Divi 1.0, 2.0, there was no visual builder. You know, you're just right. building with basically wireframe mode or a version, a classic version of wireframe mode. And um, so Divi started taking off. Um, extra was still in development and we launched extra and I, I don't like to use this word, but it, it flopped a little bit, you know, I mean, it just wasn't, we had sneak peeked it, you know, so far ahead of, of its launch. Um, and by the time we launched it, people were just in love with Divi and there was nothing we could do about it. Um, and so we basically, instead of going to the next theme, um, I, while, while Extra was being developed, I designed Monarch and Bloom. Um, and then once those were done, um, it was like, let's go back and do a 2.0 of Divi. Mm. Um, and so that was when we revamped a lot of the demos, you know, like the live demos. We added, I think, 20, 30 new modules. We added um, thousands of more design capabilities. And it's still... At that point, it was still a fraction of what Divi has now. And it just felt like oh. so much. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I got into it. The company I mentioned earlier where I subcontracted for them, they used Divi. And they were telling me, you know, they were like, well, try it out. We ju they just started doing like all of their websites like that. I told you it was a bit of a mess and it wasn't anything to do with Divi. It was because of the way they had done their process previously. And they started using Divi. And I think it was right before 2.0 came out is when I got into it. And then okay. once 2.0 came out, that's when it really like 
hit that next level. I felt like with the, definitely the lay, just the pre-made stuff and and obviously the UI and everything else. Yeah, yeah. I think that was me evolving a little bit um, as as a I don't want to call myself a web designer, but um, evolving just like understanding WordPress a lot more and understanding what people want out of Divi. Um, but I also think that that was when I realized like okay, it's hard to go back and change things mm. <laughs> once we've launched them. Um, I, that's one of the biggest things for people to understand too. I know a lot of people have, which I know you you guys have the same requests coming over and over, but the trick mm-hmm. is, is like you mentioned, there are now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people using this. You can't just revert some things and flip a switch because it's, I, and I'm, I know you guys are all aware, every little change affects everything on everybody's website so i can only imagine amazed. the care you'd be that amazed you like you change one little thing you're like no one's no one's gonna notice that <laughs> and like literally an instant after launch it's like oh my gosh this changed on my website everything's different. yeah especially with all these hosting providers and mm-hmm. and wordpress managers out there that will take like screenshots before and after a long update you know and be like oh pixel yeah, is different yeah. <laughs> you know was it was it 3.0 when the visual builder came out that the colors changed or was that in a 2.0 update? I'm trying to remember. I think it probably would have been 3.0, which I was not a part of. Um, Cause that yeah. threw me for a loop. <laughs> well, never forget. I love, I got, I intentionally got very used to the visual builder cause I knew I would come around to it. Uh, but I remember I was so locked in with the previous colors in the back end of the UI that when it changed, part of my heart dropped because I was like, oh, I miss my colors I'm used to. Luckily now, like since 3.0, the colors are still the same and stuff. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was trying to remember when that had happened because yeah, there were little changes like that that I, I know that's probably more so than anything. You're, you're probably hesitant to affect UI just because that's the workflow of, of everybody. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be afraid though of evolving, you know, and I sure. think that, I think that that's, what happens. And I mean, if, if we go back, if we go back to 2.0, not a whole lot changed in terms of UI. Um, I think we maybe did revamp some colors in, in 2.0 in wireframe mode. We just made things more rich. We improved contrast. And so that might've been there, but Mm -hmm. you know, what, what we've been afraid to do is affect people's websites. And that I, I'm, I'm all for, you know, we can't just all of a sudden switch to a flex based or a grid based grid, CSS grid based grid. We can't just all of a sudden switch how our base typography styles look as much as I want to, um, because literally everything would change in such a drastic way. All brand new websites looking great. Two million existing websites broken, you know, right. quote unquote broken. Um, And so what I don't want to be afraid of is actually making the UI better, making the experience better, even if it does require some change. Um, And it's something we still try to avoid. We try not to break the paradigms within Divi because people are so fast at using Divi at this point. You know, the experts, someone like you, who just like doesn't have to think twice when looking for X option within X module, right? Um, But if if I believe that there's a better experience out there for building and it might take someone like you 48 hours to learn, I think we should change it, you know, and I don't think everything should change, but I do, I do think Divi can't be afraid. I Divi can't be afraid of evolving in terms of its, of its interface. Well, that it's very much appreciated from somebody like myself that you say that just knowing the amount of care and thought that goes into that. But like you said, I mean, things move forward and you're looking for better ways. And I know that you guys use Divi yourself. Like you have yeah. your team and you're, you're, you know, you're a web designer figuring it out as well. So you know what works and what could be better. And I think a practical and prime example of that is the visual builder. I know a lot of people, <laughs> it's so funny just being in the community because I was pretty heavily involved in the community at that point. I, I think I really mm-hmm. got into it. And I'll never forget when the visual builder came out, I posted a picture of me and my wife sitting next to my computers. And that became the main group, the main picture for my uh, Divi group, uh, Divi web designers. And um, that day, I'll never forget like the mix of emotion. People like loved the builder and then people hated the visual builder. There was such a mix of everywhere in between. And 
I mean, I was a realist. I, I knew there were going to be bugs to work out with anything like that, but I never had anything that just destroyed any of my websites. It was just a matter of getting used to this new system, which mm-hmm. I, at, at first, the, my workflow, I don't know if you'll find this interesting as someone, I, I know you weren't with Elegant Themes at the time of the Visual Builder, but my workflow still at that time was to build the site and lay it out on the back end and then go to the visual builder to do more of the advanced styling and things more visually. So it's kind of mixed of the two. Now I'm completely visual builder. I very mm-hmm. rarely go into the back end. So it's shifted over time. Um, but a prime example of like, you know, instead of just going backward, and I, I think a lot of theme creators and a lot of companies tend to just stick with what works and there doesn't seem to be as much vision casting, which is probably hats off to you, Kenny, and, and probably Nick for being open to it and for the team at Elegant Themes who you guys are so incredibly customer-centric and customer-focused that it's very clear when you roll out these updates and these, these next changes and teasers that it's very customer-centric and you have us in mind, which is massively appreciated, man. But again, like I like the idea that well, part of me as somebody who doesn't like change doesn't like it, but I realize if you're going to be in web, you got to be used to change. And I kind of know now if you guys make a change, it's, it's for the, our benefit. It may take a little bit to get used to, but there's thinking behind that. You don't just change something just because you feel like changing it. Yeah. And there's definitely some restrictions there, right? Like if we want to add functionality for um, something and, and just the current UI isn't built for it. There's not room for it. It's, you know, there's doesn't there's not an obvious place to put something. Um, we just put, we, just, we pick the less of ten evils, you yeah, know, and, and yeah. that's where it goes, and that's what it becomes. Um, and the problem with that is it's not always the best solution. Um, in terms of like, okay, what if we were designed to be from scratch? Where would we put this option? Maybe not here. You know, and so that's where we get a lot of feedback saying like, well, it doesn't make sense for it to be here. And it's like, well, it doesn't make sense for it to be anywhere else either uh, in this framework, in this existing framework. Right. And then you sit and then you hear people say like, oh, well, like this other builder does it like this. And it's like, well, the other builder has a completely different interface and it right. that makes sense for them, you know. Um, and so I think that there was a lot of understandable frustration, at least from my end, being kind of a third party at the time when the visual builder came out of what where is that frustration coming from you know like we'll just use wireframe mode it's like oh well i didn't know wireframe mode is a thing and and yes. so you know there was i think there's a lot of education you know in divi that has to happen when changes come about but i also think we need to do a better job at understanding like why did people like the classic builder why do people not like the visual builder why do people like the visual builder why do people not like the classic builder um and I personally believe that there is a middle ground that we can reach if we're willing to change the UI um, where people can get the best of both worlds and kind of like my future philosophy for Divi, for Divi is kind of like the best of all worlds. You know, how do people, how can people access all the, all the ways that they like to build when they want that way to build in that yeah. moment? I know with the, the with the wireframe mode and the visual builder, when I found out about that, that was a game changer for me because I was fearful of the back end, the classic builder, you know, being done mm-hmm. away with. But the fact that you guys heard, you heard the people talk about that and factored that in, it was just a huge relief to me because I my mind still works in a block format. However, the ability to get in and do things visually is unmatched and unrivaled mm-hmm. in WordPress. Like these are the visual builders just do not compare. And it's got very seamless now too. I mean, I know so many updates and um, different versions have been updated to where the bugginess in the beginning of the visual builder, which I know you weren't a part of, is really gone from from what I've experienced. Like, of course, every once in a while when you're really getting custom and you're doing negative margins and different padding and stuff, inevitably you're going to have to tinker with it. But it's yeah. really remarkable how smooth a system it is. And I don't have to tell you that, but... Um, it's really come a long way, man. It's, it's, it's really awesome. And actually, I wanted to ask you, because um, you left to work for Google in 2015, and that was before 3.0. So you just kind of saw what was going on on the outside at that point. Yeah, right? so we had just launched. We, had, we were kind of just coming off of the high from 2.0, 2.4, which okay. damn near killed me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that was 
a lot of new changes. Um, I, I just, I can't even think back at the time. I was so I stressed. I think that's um, some of the stuff that threw me for a loop in the beginning was 2.4. I do remember that one being a pretty pretty extensive update. There's there was some, some new stuff. Like we introduced this idea of like specialty sections and yes. like a lot yeah. of different just like layout options and and we, you know, gutter widths and full width rows. And there was a lot, I mean, if you look at things before 2.4, I mean, you couldn't even style like an H2 I have, within a module. Like, <laughs> I have one site that is on not great hosting and we haven't been able to upgrade because of the PHP version and it's on, I think, 2.1 or something like that. And the last time I logged in, I was like, holy crap, <laughs> how far Divi has come. It's worthwhile just like having a, a site with that version just to see how far it's come. Yeah. And so that was when, uh, I mean, at that point we were just working on I can't remember what happened between 2.4 and 3.0. I, I pretty much left right after 2.4, but okay. kind of like within the last month of me being at Elegant Themes, um, I designed some interface concepts for the visual builder. Very, very quick. Probably spent a couple days on it. Um, and that was pretty much all I, all I did for the VB, for the visual builder. And... Um, I when it launched, I was probably a year into into Google, um, and I remember I remember reading the the response the, the response from the crowds, and it was like, oh, like I like I know how much work went into it, and I know how much it was better. You know, I knew what it was yeah. going towards, and um, Nick and I, people that use design software every day, like obviously that was the inspiration, and um something a lot more visual and it was just like it it i think even if it wasn't buggy it would have had the same oh it wouldn't have feedback i, I can't imagine the thick skin you have to grow as a software creator like that particularly when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of customers i i can only imagine and yeah. i actually i was curious when you got back with elegant themes in 2017 what did divi look like at that point like what did, did they kind of just integrate you back in with the functionality or was your more was your role more of the design aspect and then work in the layouts what did that look like because that was um, a big that was a big turning point man for for divi 2017 through 18 i feel like that's when a lot of the features and the upgrades really came into play yeah when i came in um i hadn't used divi in two years <laughs> you know i it was i had watched it grow but i hadn't really had a reason to use it um and so that was when so design software was finally breaking out of the Adobe shell and competitors were, um, were rising. Uh, you know, you had Adobe XD, you had Sketch. Um, and I was using all these tools. And um, I remember when I started using the Visual Builder, I was like, this feels like I'm in a design software, but it doesn't have the functionality of design software. Mm, yeah. And so that was that was one thing that I kind of had to own in that first year was like, how do we make the visual builder easier and faster to use in the same way that wireframe mode was, or, or classic builder was easy and fast. Um, and, you know, when, whenever you're looking at something completely visual and moving things around, it's going to be faster than moving around a set of blocks in, in like a, you know, wireframe mode view. And so it was like, how do we build in a lot of like keyboard shortcuts? How do we build in a lot of, you know, style management, copy and pasting style, copy and pasting modules. Um, I don't know if anyone's using quick actions. To me, it's the most underrated feature in Divi. I use it at, for every single action. I rarely click anything in Divi. I rarely use my mouse. Um, it is very it is very underrated. I, I don't think most people know about it as much. Um, yeah. But there is, I'll, I'll link to it. I'll make a note to link to it in the show notes. Just the, the um, shift, the shift space. Just next time you're using Divi, click shift space. It's going to open up an interface that is, um, allows you to pretty much do any action in Divi with a few keystrokes. I'll be honest. I, I've kind of, I looked at quite a few of them initially and then I've kind of got away from it just cause I kind of forgot it's not yeah. that talked about, but you really inspired me to get back at it because those are huge time savers and it's very 
user friendly as far as how interactive it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Like when I add a module, I'm adding it through quick actions every single time. That's awesome. You know, and a lot of times when I do Divi tutorials, I'll do like expand styles between certain yep. modules of the row and people are like, holy crap, I didn't <laughs> even know you could do that. I go one by one. I'm like, welcome to Divi, man. This is yeah. one of the beautiful things about it that most builders just don't have. Um, and but that, yeah, I was, I was, that system I was, is soon to be um, a lot better. Okay, very soon. sweet. Well, I, I like, I think it's that one I really like already. So I'm, I'm pumped. Um, but yeah, I was kind of curious, like when you came back into the company, how your role shifted and, and what Divi looked like. Cause did it ever feel like your baby? Like you, you yes. helped launch this thing and then you're all, you're moving, you're probably watching it grow from the sideline. You probably felt like a yeah. stepdad or something. And then, then you get back in the family after that. <laughs> yeah, I definitely called it that. Like, that's how I refer to it. And I, I still think it is. And, um, you know, I, I think that half of what I do is moving to be forward and half of what I do is like, how do we, I don't want to say fix, but how do we go back and make the things, the decisions that we made better? And mm. that's the hard part. You know, that is the hard part. And um, so I was, so I was doing that. I was working on efficiency, design efficiency in Divi. I was working on um, the Divi library. Um, so design Divi library. And um, yeah, two years ago, there wasn't a way to add a pre-made layout, you know, you had to like go to our blog, find something, download the JSON, go into the Divi library, import the JSON, download WordPress importer first, import the JSON, yeah. um, go to a page, import it. Was, it was a nightmare, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, so worked on the library. And then there was also a couple other features that I worked on that took about a year and a half to build. Um, so things that have been released fairly recently. Um, and then... I was also t tasked with, with building out a design team that would build out layouts. And so that was, that's what I spend a majority of my time doing um, just because, you know, we could try to spit out things fast and people still think we should spend longer on each layout pack. Um, but I'm trying to find a happy ground middle there. Uh, you, you know, I, I don't necessarily like to call them pre-made websites because I, that's not nearly what they are. Um, I think they're there to show off what Divi can do. Um, it's also great. I found for people who don't have an eye for design or they're coming from maybe mm -hmm. a more technical background or, or maybe just a different generation that maybe isn't, you know, they just have no idea how to, how to start. It's so one thing I mentioned in a couple of my courses, I tell a lot of my students, if you don't have an eye for design yet, or you get stuck, try, just use a layout as inspiration. You don't even necessarily have to to build the yeah. page off of that. You can just look at it and see how it's structured. You're used to how they style stuff and then the modules and then you can get a feel for like a good design flow. It's conversion-based design that you guys have already done the hard work. So you can learn a lot yeah. from a layout and then craft your site almost next to it. So there's a yeah. little free hack for everybody there. If you're stuck, just design something next to a layout uh, and you can thank Kenny later. <laughs> yeah, and we got some cool things that on the whiteboard, you know, of like making that even better in terms of mm like UI kits. And again, like what I was saying, like getting rid of the idea of a child theme is a, is a big statement for styling. And so speaking of that, like the, the other, or excuse me, the old themes for elegant themes, all the others, you know, ones that like I used to use before Divi, when did that shift for the business for elegant themes? When did you guys realize like, okay, we're doubling down on Divi. This is our flagship product. We're not worrying about creative other themes. Was that before you left? Or... That was like two weeks after launch. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. It was that soon. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know you say you did extra and stuff. I didn't realize it was that soon where you it guys was, really, yeah. It was like more realistically was in month, a couple months, a few months. Okay. We were like, yeah. nobody is buying other themes. Gotcha. Yeah. It was crazy quick. So cool, man. Yeah. And it's, it's gotta be awesome. I know I was on Divi chat with Nick on, uh, I think it was episode hundred and he mentioned in that one, I'll link that too. He mentioned that he one business advice that he gave people is if you create something that is like a flagship product, focus on that. Like if that's your money maker, double down. Don't spread yourself too thin. It's the eighty twenty rule too, where twenty percent of your work is, you know, eighty percent of your income. Focus on that. Like, and mm -hmm. I did that for my services too. Actually, after that Divi Chat episode, Nick Dunn got me inspired because I was like, <laughs> you know what? I'm doing like graphic design work and print work right now. And it's 
the same amount of time, but I'm just not making that much from it. So I cut it out. And then my revenue went up because I was able to focus on the high level stuff. So really good piece of advice there from Nick. And it's very prevalent with Divi. So, so that's really cool, man. And then like, I know we're not going to talk like sneak peeks or or roadmap kind of stuff, but I think you've already alluded to where your headspace is with Divi. Um, Yeah. Any, anything like that you're excited about, about the future of Divi that you'd like to talk about? Yeah. I'll throw you a bone. Yes. (laughs) Got it. (laughs) Um, no, you know, it's funny because I, I, I think I said this in my uh, Divi Nation interview like two years ago. Yeah, a couple of years um, ago, right? Yeah. But where I want to go with Divi is um, more at, at the global website level, right? We, we focus so much at the granular level in the beginning. And we've even allowed you to do some, some global things from within the visual builder, right? You look at global, global presets, or uh, gl- global defaults, sorry, um, it, where you can actually say like, I want, um, you know, every X module, every button to look like this, or every blurb to look like this. You can actually set those defaults in Divi now, and it'll affect your entire website, every instance of that of that module. Um, it's a little undiscoverable. So if you don't know about it, next time you have the settings model open, there's a little a little globe icon in the upper right that you can click. Um, and it'll allow you to style every instance of that type of module um, across your whole website. Can you explain the difference between the theme customizer and that as well, Kenny? Because I yeah, think yeah, a lot yeah. of people get that confused. It's I an know evolution. I, yeah. It's an evolution of the theme customizer. And we couldn't deprecate the theme customizer entirely because there's some stuff there that doesn't make sense to be in this idea of like a module based. Uh, if anybody sure. knows of what used to be the module customizer, um, which again, a lot of people don't know about, um, it was basically a way to say these are all the defaults for every module so if you know you could say i want every blur like right now if you add a blurb onto the page it has some styling for the title or it has you know a size and a, and a font for the title size and font for the text um and you could have set all that at a global level in the in the module customizer so we pretty much got rid of all of that and put it into global defaults. There were some things that were in the customizer that should have never been there that we moved into defaults. I don't really have a good answer for what the difference is um, it, because they are, they are so much the same thing. Um, but for global defaults, um, what's interesting about that is it's site level editing from within the instance of a single page. Right. So gotcha. That's breaking a lot of brains because normally you would do that in like a theme options scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we don't really have a great place for that right now. We have the theme customizer, which is super weak. We have theme options, also known as ePanel, that lets you do some styling. It lets you like establish, you know, like a color palette and some other theme you know, some styling around some like WooCommerce layouts and stuff, Mm -hmm. but it's very scattered. It's not a lot. Um, So our goal is to continue to bring global level editing to an instance of a page. Um, You know, things like uh, better things around color management, typography management, and layout management from within this, uh, within the context of a page. So you don't have to leave the page to edit global settings. Right. But then there's this, um, that's kind of like coming at it from like, I have my website, I've designed a page, now I wanna go edit the global settings. That's a very like reactive approach to using Divi. Um, and then there's like the proactive approach to using Divi, which is like someone like you that's like building a brand new website. Where are you gonna go manage all of those global styles? You're not gonna build a page and then manage right. the global styles. Right, I usually write to the theme customizer, yeah. Yeah, and so that interface doesn't exist. That's something that we've thought a lot, I've thought a lot about. Um, and there's some really cool ideas around that for, for bringing all that stuff outside of the visual builder, gotcha. right? But gotcha. using the visual builder that everybody knows and loves to interact with that interface. Um, and then uh, some other ideas that I have are just catering a little bit more towards people's workflows. Like I think we designed Divi to like maybe work okay on like a laptop, you know? But when you're on a 27 inch, 30 inch monitor, there's so much more that we can do to make Divi more efficient and faster when you're editing mm-hmm. a page. Um, there's so much more we can give you access to. And thing, again, I mean, we've talked about three or four things in the last 20 minutes where it's like people are probably gonna be like, I've never heard of that. 
And, you know, that's a problem. So I want to make those things a lot more accessible, um, better interaction between wireframe mode and visual building so that there's a little bit more seamlessness between toggling between those two experiences for when you want wireframe, when you don't. Um, and then taking Divi completely, um, I don't know, like really dynamic, you know, like right now, if you edit like one page, it's hard for all of that stuff to affect your entire website. And so you find yourself doing copy and pasting styles and saving stuff to the library and loading it back on your page. And then you go to a brand new website and you kind of got to start from scratch. And it's like all of these things that maybe you're really fast at, but when you think about it, still take forever. Sure. That can add up for sure. Yeah. And so I think that there's ways to make building a website in Divi three, four times faster than it is now. Um, and so that's the goal for me is how do we make building websites faster? And that's not going to come from building in micro interactions from within the visual builder. That's going to be from us taking a step back and looking at Divi as a theme and not as a builder, gotcha. as a page builder. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, man. Well, I'm pumped. I, I love where things sound like they're headed. Obviously all the, the recent features have been awesome. Like the past, particularly the handful of features with some of the scroll effects and stuff, like it's really eliminated the need. I, I still do a lot of custom CSS and stuff, but the ability to be able to do a lot of stuff in Divi. And you know, one little hack that I, that I started to apply, I teach this in my uh, CSS course, is sometimes instead of manually writing CSS, what I'll do is create a module, put the scroll effects and customize it with Divi, and then I'll copy the code and then be able to apply that to like gravity forms or different things that you can't customize because they're a different platform or something, or they're a different tool. So there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with that too, with what you guys have done with Divi. So that's we're awesome. That, we're hopefully have proposed making that a lot easier, which is an actual option to cop, to copy the CSS of any option group Ooh. Um, that it prints. So, you know, all of that stuff that, 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 um, I mean, there's a lot of tools that do stuff like that already. Um, you know, even if you look at something like CSS hero, um, but those are the things that I want to look into, you know, and, and just things that are difficult with Divi now in terms of like, you know, the limitations of layout, the limitations mm -hmm. of, of responsive design and, and just the intuitiveness of like editing stuff on a global scale without a child theme. It's just not there yet. Yeah, um, yeah. we have a long way to go. It's not going to be overnight. It's not going to be fast. We're going to break a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, we're going to break a lot of stuff if we don't do it right is a better way to put that, you know? And, yeah, yeah. and we've something that I just want to say that is because of Nick and not me is every version of Divi, Divi one, two, three, four, five, it's the same Divi, you know, you didn't have to buy a new product and now some of your themes are on Divi one and some of your themes are on Divi two. It, it w w a lot of software, a lot of other page builders will say, Oh, this is brand new Divi, new grid, new styles. I'm still on Basecamp 2, and now my agency, we're, there's a we're different version. We're using a Basecamp 3, so it's like a whole different experience. Yeah, and so yeah. every change, every change ever that we've ever made in Divi has had to work with everything in with past Divi. Divi. And yeah. that, that is something that um, doesn't get thought about a lot. It doesn't get appreciated enough. Our developers do... <clears throat> a ton of work making oh, sure that imagine. we're not changing stuff. And, and, you know, that's half the development is making sure that what you're developing isn't undeveloping what you're doing. You've done. Oh, in the past. Good point. Good point. Um, and so, you know, as the ship gets bigger, it gets a lot harder to turn. Um, and, you know, I, I think that again, we can't be afraid of, of changing, but we can't be afraid of changing Divi, but we, we do need to be very wary of, doing anything that will change somebody's website. Yeah. Well, again, it is much appreciated from myself and on behalf of the entire Divi community, man. It's been life-changing to say the least. I, if we could, maybe just, man, before we start wrapping this up, I know we talked about imposter syndrome a little bit. Uh, I think that's really relevant, even just with the creation of Divi, because particularly even when things change, you can feel like an imposter because mm -hmm. you may not know, you feel like you don't know as much as myself or other people, or Sometimes when people want to get into Divi, they're like, oh my gosh, it's too much. I feel like an imposter. Um, 
you shared with me a podcast episode that you started, which I really, I'm going to convince you to really get going on your podcast. Do you want me to link that in the show notes, your podcast? Sure. I, I, I don't have any launched episodes yet. I have about 10 recorded um, that I'll, I'll probably start launching here too, but it's a podcast called The Art Department, The Art Department, and it's uh, a podcast about creativity. So it's not specifically about web design or my side hustle, which is pottery. It's not just about painting. So we have a lot of people on the show that are architects, engineers. You know, I, I envision people like chefs, someone like yourself um, being on that podcast. And we talk about how those people navigate the world as creatives and how in a lot of ways that's a struggle and how a lot of ways it's very liberating um, and how much people have in common that are creative. Um, and, and just the goal is to help everybody realize that they're creative in some capacity. Um, you know, it, I, I just talked to a, a good friend and he's like, you know, a good question that I like to ask people is just like, what do you make? And a lot of people might go, oh, I don't make anything. And there's always something that everybody makes. Mm, yeah. They just might not think of it as something that they're creating with their hands. You know, whether or not that's just something, do you make coffee in the morning? Do you, you know, sketch? Do you, like, there's all of these things that people make, you know, whether or not they're gardeners or they're just someone that, that likes to do something around the house. And so it's, it's this idea that we all have this like shared connection between our creativity. I totally agree. My wife says that. She says, I'm not a creative, but once we have two girls now, <laughs> that changed pretty quickly once she's like, okay, I made babies. You know, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole different ball game. And then now she's making a home, you know, all this other stuff. But yeah. I think um, one, I'll definitely link that podcast because you talked about imposter syndrome. And the reason I found that extra fascinating coming from you, Kenny, is you are somebody with your resume. If you look at your resume on paper, it's like this dude freaking created Divi, worked for Apple, worked for Google. You have like, the, from my mind, like one of the most impressive resume type of roles and positions. You're managing a team. <laughs> But you alluded to the fact that you really struggled with imposter syndrome, particularly at a company like Google. Um, could you just, before we wrap up here, would you mind just expanding on that and maybe yeah. how you can, that can encourage people to, to not feel that? You know, there's, there's no way to ever make someone not feel it. You know, you're going to feel it. The, 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 the thing, my advice with imposter syndrome is to hold it, <laughs> hold mm. that anxiety, hold that fear. Um, and figure out a way to to use it to feel yourself or to you know use it to make it make you i guess appreciate the difficulty of what you're doing you know what you do everyone no matter what your industry is what you're doing requires skill um and you're you probably spent a lot of years learning how to do it which means it's hard you know and not everybody can just change industries or change roles or change responsibilities um, and do it easily. And some people are better at it than others, you know? Uh, some people are just a little more confident, um, can, can pick up new things. Some people are just more naturally gifted at, at understanding concepts of different um, things. But, you know, it's, imposter syndrome is super interesting because it's not, I, I one, have just struggled with anxiety my entire life. And um, it's not something I ever was able to like put my thumb on, you know, when you're younger, you're not like, oh, I, I struggle from anxiety. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you use the word very loosely, right? Oh, I'm anxious or I'm nervous. Um, and so, you know, but anxiety is a real thing. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that I have like, you know, clinical anxiety, but I, I have my, my fear. I think one of my favorite quotes is uh, Salvador Dali and it's, have no fear of perfection because you're never going to reach it. And I think that my, my fear has always been like, how do I, what if I'm not perfect? What if it's mm. not perfect? You know, and it's like, once I realize like, well, you're never going to be perfect. So don't fear it, you know? Um, and it shouldn't be your goal, but you think that everybody around you is perfect, right? especially if you've never met them, you're just going to assume the best. You're going to assume this person is good at what they do, especially in the context of a Google, of an Apple. It's like, oh, well, this person got hired here. They must be amazing. But then you're like, well, I'll, I also got hired here. So what does everybody think about me if they don't know me, right? They're thinking the exact same thing. And so that fear and anxiety, everybody has it. Um, 
some people, like I said, deal with it better than others. But, you know, I have, I have those same feelings at Elegant Themes in a small company. You know, it doesn't really matter the size of the company. Um, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're a designer or developer, like you said, just a new user of Divi feeling like, oh, you know, I'm in this Facebook group of tens of thousands of people. If I ask a question, is it a stupid question? If I give advice, is somebody going to tear me apart? Um, maybe, probably. Mm-hmm. You're never going to find out unless you do it, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's uh, imposter syndrome is something that you don't really hear a lot about. I think it's gaining traction. but Unless yeah, you would listen to episode 10 of the podcast here because yeah. I covered what helped for me. And you, man, you're exactly right. Like there are ways to channel it because I still feel it. I still feel it all the time. And yeah. I've learned to be more confident. And my confidence has come with experience. And as I've got older, my priorities have shifted to my family to where I almost don't give two shits what anyone says professionally or like in the web design world. That's helped. I yeah. will be honest, when I started my YouTube channel, man, you talk about imposter syndrome. Some of the comments I would get would really affect me if they were like, dude, your videos are trash or something like that. Uh, but again, going back to now, like the, the impact that I've made on, on students and other people in the community has kind of fueled, fueled my, uh, my confidence to fight off imposter syndrome. But I know one thing I tell a lot of students is you're going to feel it, particularly in web design, because there's other people who are really good designers. They know a lot more. They've been at it. But that doesn't mean that has to discourage you of anything. It can really pump you up. And, and like mm-hmm. you said, you might look at something, a layout pack that you guys designed or, or somebody's site, and you might say, you might feel defeated because it's like, man, that is like so much better than what I'm doing right now. And what I've learned is you can use that to say, well, what do I like about that? Like, can I just pull one, two or three things that they did mm-hmm. that I really like that I can level up and then it's going to help me be more confident. And before you know it, people are looking at your stuff going, that dude or that gal really has some stuff, some sweet chops. So I, yeah, I'm not going to get into what I said in that episode because it's there, but there's a lot of things that you can do. And you know what, to be honest, Kenny, what I've realized, I think the most important thing with imposter syndrome for me is I've realized that nobody is an expert. Even people like yourself who are very advanced in a lot of these fields, it's impossible to be a quote unquote expert because stuff changes so fast. Yeah. And uh, particularly like with Divi, with you know, the amount of updates and stuff, it's, it's impossible to know everything about Divi. There's just so much that, that you, know, you can learn and changes. So you know, I hope that helps because I, I realized, um, and, and actually something you said I thought was fascinating in that first podcast episode you released, which I can't wait for you to get going on that podcast. But you talked about, didn't you say there was like a call for fighting imposter syndrome or something like that at Google? Can you, can you talk about that? Because I found that experience and that story yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, I, when I started at Google, it was like, I, I mean, I've never felt more like an imposter in my entire life. Like everybody's nice. Not everybody. A lot of people are nice. Um, but, you know, you, you, Google has been put up on this pedestal for so many years as being crazy interviews, right? It's not an easy interview. I won't lie mm-hmm. about that. Um, and once you get in, you just think like everybody is like a genius, like a lot of PhDs, a lot of people that know, wear a lot of hats. And, um, you know, once you start working with these people and you understand their skills, um, you realize that, I don't want to say you're on the same level as them, but you know, you're dealing with the same struggles in terms of what your skills are and maybe you're bringing something to the table that they're not and vice versa. But the problem is, is the people that you don't get to know right? People in other departments, people that are way above you. And when you're interacting with those people, you can totally feel like I, I'm safer if I don't speak up. I'm safer if I don't say something stupid or ask the wrong question or ask someone to clarify something. You know, I was working in the world of payments, which is the most confusing industry on the planet. And I just never asked the questions. I never asked what certain acronyms meant. I never asked, well, what if this person is in this country using this form of payment and they have this kind of business? And so what the, the problem was is I wasn't being the best of me. I wasn't being the best of me because I didn't have all the information because I felt like I was an imposter to even ask for clarification, right? And so there was this class at Google that was offered just called like fighting imposter syndrome or something like that. And I was like, that's interesting. That was like the first time I had really heard the term and understood what it meant. And so I was like, well, I'm going to go to that. And 
it was something that was, it was offered on campus pretty regularly. And I went and the room was packed. I mean, it was, there were so many people there and I recognized people in that room that I was scared of, you know? And it was wow. like, damn, these people that, that I'm feeling like an imposter around are also feeling like an imposter. And you have to realize, like, like you said, like someone looking at like the layout packs that we're putting out, you got to realize that people also hate these layouts that we're putting out. You know, there's so much hate and negativity around the layout packs that we design. It's like someone might think it's awesome. The next person might think it's not. And the person that's designing those layout packs might feel like an imposter as well. Right. And oh, I still yeah. feel like an imposter in this web design space because I've never been a heavy web developer, you know, and so I'm designing tools for an audience that I am not. And so, you know, you're it was interesting taking that class because after during the class, the way that the class was run was like, how, let's ideate on how we can make this less of a thing at Google. And no one wants to speak up in the class because they all feel like imposters. Oh, yeah. You know? And so it's, you know, I actually was really vocal in that class because that was about the time when I was super ready to leave. I felt like an imposter for years there, for a year and a half there. And I was like, I'm just going to, treat this like an exit interview. Like these are the problems and it's not mm. me. The problems are the systems, you know, and the problem is people aren't talking about this. So the best thing you can do is whoever you're feeling like an imposter around, tell them. Cause I guarantee you, I know what their answer is going to be. Dude, you're doing great. You know, like, the, how, what, what can I, what can I, what can I teach you? How, what, what do you want to learn? I found that people in the Facebook groups, particularly my group, because my group is like almost 21,000 people now. So inevitably, you're wow. going to get some, you know, you're going to get some shitty responses. Um, but inevitably, somebody will be like, check out my website. And then if they just say that, they'll get trashed if it's not a good website. But if somebody says, hey, I'm brand new to design, take it easy on me, but I love constructive criticism, the comments are like nine times out of 10, really good constructive criticism yeah. uh, and good feedback. So yeah, prime example of just, saying yeah i think i think being vocal about that is huge and luckily i think in our climate one thing i like about the professional world and just the world in general now is people are more open to how they're feeling about anxiousness or uh imposter syndrome in particular i know an episode i've got coming up i'm going to do an interview with a friend of mine about the danger of comparison which mm -hmm. it feeds into oh, yeah. imposter syndrome particularly in web design like i mentioned you see somebody's website and you're like oh my gosh they're so much better than me like you know, what am I doing? And then it can get you discouraged, but there's definitely some ways to combat that. And I think, I think just think it's fascinating that a company like Google, I don't know how many people were there, but like that many people were feeling exactly what you felt. That's fascinating. I mean, everyone's feeling it. Like I said before, yeah. it's, it's everyone feels it to some degree, right? Um, and it keeps people from taking on managerial roles. It, 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 um, like even if you think about like asking for a raise, that's like the first feeling you have is like, do I really deserve it? You know, I just uh, got th this morning. I talked with one of my students and we're, we're I'm helping her raise her rates. And that was the first thing she told us. She's like, I feel kind of like an imposter if I want to raise my rates, but I'm like, you're so much more valuable than what you're charging right now. And it'll breed that mm -hmm. confidence. And one thing that I love in regards to raising rates to combat imposter syndrome is once people do it, and then they get one or two sales with a higher rate, then it like clicks. Then they're like, yeah. Ooh, I am. I am worth this. And then their sales changes and, and their mannerism and their confidence changes. So it's a lot it really of little things to, like that that can help. Yeah. It really comes down to valuing yourself and, and under, and like being humble. And, and like I said, like you're not going to be perfect. Like that's a bad goal to strive for, you I'm know, always strive, quote, strive for, strive for striving for perfection. What was the quote that you said earlier? Uh, yeah, have the, no fear of perfection. You'll never reach it. Salvador. Dali. That's awesome. That's really good. I, I think the same has to apply with website design. I tell this to some of my clients, like, you know, you can nitpick something to death. It's never going to be perfect because a website is never quote unquote done. So yeah. my rule of thumb is get it damn good enough to where you're like, you know, really like this and then go for it. Launch that sucker. Otherwise, that's why so many designers can never design their websites because they're just stuck trying to get it perfect over and over and over and over again. And then three years later, you don't do anything. Yeah, there's a term <laughs> in, there's a thing in, in um, like the, the agency space. It's just like, never design your own website, never do your own branding. Honestly, you know? um, <laughs> so you're, you're, go, yeah. you're your worst client ever. Yeah. Um, but there's one thing that 
that stands out is something that I've learned from Nick and it's, you know, do not be afraid to launch something. Mm. Um, you might be fighting the legacy forever, which we are, but if we waited to get Divi to a place that we were, you know, completely happy with, it would have taken us two more years to even launch it. And then you would have been behind the curve. You would have never learned from your mistakes. You would have never gotten the feedback from the crowd. And so, you know, he's done a great job with elegant themes at just like launching stuff, you know? And if you're not confident in what you're building in terms of like an MVP, maybe your idea is not good enough, Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe like, but the chances are your idea is great. And the chances are that once you get it out there, you're going to get feedback. And the chances are, if it's if it's in the right space, you're gonna you're gonna be successful. Yeah, and I've always appreciated the way Elegant Themes as a brand, but also Nick in particular, has handled uh, a lot of the criticism because it's like you just mm. can never please everybody. It's like if you don't do a new update in the next couple of months, people are like, "Where's the new update?" But then if you do too many, people are like, "They're posting way too many updates." So it's like the perfect storm of you just can't please everybody. So go, you know, please do what yourself. you do. Yeah, yeah, do what you know works for for Divi and. Just focus on folks like myself and other people who are actually, you know, back in the Elegant Themes team to to keep on going for it. So, how many websites do you have, have? Do you think you've built with Divi? Three hundred plus, easy. Uh, maybe maybe four hundred or more. Since and how many of those do you think you still manage right now? We manage right now. Some of those were like either I'm including like test sites and yeah. and stuff for courses and um, development sites and stuff. And we manage just under a hundred total right now. Uh, like how many then, do you think are on the latest version of Divi? Um, probably close to that on our maintenance plan. We have 70 some that are on the, the most recent version. Okay. Uh, and then probably another 50 to 60 that are on different versions that maybe aren't on our maintenance plan. Um, yeah. but then I've got a lot of other sites that are updated towards that. Like I said, I've only got a I think there's only one that is pre 3.0 right now, which wow, is that one I mentioned. So that's pretty, that's pretty good. They're all up to date or, or at least fairly up to date. And even if we, if we have a client that reaches out from like two years ago and we do work for them, I'll tell them, listen, we also need to update the theme and stuff like that. So we'll get it up to date, but that's amazing. But yeah. It's yeah. It's been a wild ride though, man. It's been awesome though. Yeah. That's a cool Divi story. I mean, that was like something that really brought me back to elegant themes. It's like, I'm not creating something for like, obviously someone like you is a, is a customer of Divi, but I'm not really creating like, um, something that's just there to like make money. You know, it's there to help other people. I was, yeah, create I was get, their own thing. It really is the, I think the word behind elegant themes that I've always attributed to you guys is empowerment. Cause it yeah. really is like you empower folks like myself to, to not only build awesome websites, but it is like the core of our web, our business. Like yeah. the tool, the two main tools I use are WordPress and Divi that we don't have other themes that we use. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's been huge. I mean, it's gotta feel pretty gratifying, man, to know that you guys have impacted hundreds of thousands of customer on paper, but millions of websites. I mean, it's got, you got to go to bed at night being like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Cause it's pretty dang cool. Yeah. It's definitely special. It's definitely not something you get at every company and every product that you work on. Take it from me. Like some stuff that you work on is just, there's no fulfillment, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, there's a lot of fulfillment in knowing that we're empowering people like yourself and, and the rest of the community or even someone just building one website. Um, and I think the coolest part about it is we're scratching the surface. Yeah. Well, that's well said and exciting to hear, man. Really, really pumped up about the future. Kenny, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. I know we, we, uh, we went a little while here, but like we talked about before we went live, I think you and I are both in for a good long chat. Cause if you feel like if you try to do a podcast for half an hour, you just scratch the surface and there's so much, so much more. So I really appreciate you opening up and being transparent about uh, your journey and your roles and uh, not in your struggles too with, yeah. w- within the industry, but you've done some incredible work, man. You've really uh, made an impact on literally hundreds of thousands of people, including myself. So on behalf of the Divi community, man, thank you for the hard work and everything you've done, man. Absolutely. And thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Awesome, Kenny. Well, hey, let me know when you want me to come on your podcast and I'm excited to see that thing launch soon. <laughs> All right, will do. Thanks, man. Cheers, man. Hey guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.